Hi, Scott Harris King here, and I thought I'd make another video about my comic collection. It's day 28 of the self-isolation here, so we do have some free time on our hands, and I'm continuing to sort of catalog and sort through my comic collection. So today I thought I'd show off one of the, the favorite things in my entire collection, which is the my vintage spinner rack. So let's take a look at the rack, and let's answer the question, what's... What's on my spinner rack? So here's my spinner rack. As you can see from the uh, top piece, this is um, a later model. Uh, they started doing this in the mid 70s. And um, this model was in place in, up through the mid 80s. Uh, I was, at one point I was trying to get a, a larger one of the Hey Kids uh, comics um, with the white topper that says that from the 1960s. I haven't been able to find one of those at an affordable price yet, but I uh, just wanted to show you this one here. Um, I can tell this is uh, from after 1974 because the slots for the comics are, are not wide enough to hold the wider size books. Shortly after the publishers went to the 20 cent price point in 1974, they made the comics narrower. And so this is built for the narrower Bronze Age, uh, later Bronze Age books, as opposed to the wider Silver Age and early Bronze Age books. So here's a closer look at uh, the topper. I got very lucky with mine. Um, it's in almost perfect condition. Uh, you may have noticed there was only only flaw on mine is that this here on this one side, they put this uh, price sticker on here. Um, I haven't wanted to try and take it off. It's been on there uh, since the late 80s and I'm worried it'll damage it. And you can see the same side has just a little bit of scraping here. Um, but for the most part, it's almost new. And um, I got tremendously lucky with this. I was in the market for one of these. I desperately wanted to have a spinner rack um, as sort of like a nostalgia piece, but just to hold my comics. And, you know, it's just it's just a great piece to have uh, in any kind of comic collecting room. And um, I had been trying to find one at a reasonable price, having no luck. There's some on eBay, but they cost an incredible amount because usually – you either have to pick them up in person, which often, you know, isn't an option because it's a thousand miles away, or you have to pay like $150 shipping because they're massively heavy. Um, so I was trying to find one. I went into this uh, junk shop that I had been in a couple times before where they had some comics. They never had any comics that were really of any interest to me. But when I was looking through the comics there... Um, the guy asked if there was anything in particular I was looking for, and on a whim I said, well, you wouldn't happen to have one of those comic spinner racks, would you? And it turns out that he did. And the reason it's in such great shape is that he had opened a comic book store in my hometown um, about 20 years earlier. So this was in the late 80s during the big boom, probably or between 89 and 91. Um but they went out of business very quickly. So the spinner rack was only in use for a few weeks and he had just been storing it in the back room of his little junk shop ever since. Um, so I asked him how much he wanted for it and he said $20. And that was about the fastest $20 ever got out of my wallet. I was so excited. Um, as you can hear, it's a little squeaky right now. I need to do some, some greasing up on that. But I, I took it home. And um, didn't really have to do anything with the top. It was so beautiful. There's a couple of the uh, racks that um, could be re-welded. Um, and some of those are a little tarnished. I had to do some cleaning on those and on the center shaft. My dad helped me fix it up uh, pretty easily. Cleaned up very well. Um, once we had it lubricated and ready to go, uh, it's been... The center of my comics room ever since so that was about 2008 so about 12 years so let's take a look at what I'm keeping on my spinner rack so 
I try to have basically a theme for each side. Um, this side is sort of my Wonder Woman and Bronze Age DC side. I also keep things in here. I don't keep anything in, in the spinner rack that cost me more than a dollar um, because the spinner rack will damage them over time. Depending on how you keep them and how stuffed they are, you can see like this comic here is, is bent because it's overstuffed. Most of these comics I got in 50 cent bins or for less. Um, now I do have some comics in here that have increased in price since I put them in here. Uh, like this Wonder Woman run, you know, um, because of the movie coming up, stuff like issue 9 here with the cheetah I know is taken off, but I got this, um, the first 20 issues or so of the George Perez run at a yard sale for a quarter each. So obviously it wasn't um, a huge deal for me to put this in the spinner rack. And then I also try and kind of use this as a holding ground for titles that were, I'm in the process of putting the runs together. In this case, I did complete the entire George Perez run of Wonder Woman. So we'll see. I have issue one in a safer place. Um, but then as we go down here, we'll see the entire George Perez run on the spinner rack. And then down below we see... Um, some more Wonder Woman issues. This was um, when she was in Adventure Comics uh, during this period when it was with the Earth 2 Wonder Woman. And down here to the bottom, we get to a super team family. Uh, so that was obviously the DC side of the spinner rack. Here we have the Marvel side. Um, and this is where I'm... Um, accumulating most of my Master of Kung Fu run. Actually, some of the earlier issues don't fit here. As I mentioned, like this is about the earliest. Some of the 25 cent issues are actually too big. Uh, they're too wide. The first couple months of 25 cent issues um, were the uh, original width. So issues before this don't fit in the spinner rack. And then there's some issues that I've gotten since um, I sort of fill the spinner rack and I so I do have some issues of Master of Kung Fu in my in my boxes, but this side is almost entirely Master of Kung Fu. I've got most of the series here. I did just complete this run a few months ago, so I have the complete run now. Um, and then down at the bottom, I have this great series, uh, Amazing High Adventure, which was an anthology series from the 80s where Marvel's top talent would... Um, do adventure stories. Uh, so that's a series that I really dig. There's a lot of really cool artwork and stuff in there. Uh, now the third side here, it's mostly Archie, but then it sort of goes sideways as we get down to the bottom. The top, um, I have um, a number of issues of Archie at Riverdale High, which is uh, the Archie series that I'm currently in the process of completing. Um, I've got about half the run right now. I'm trying to pick them all up for a dollar or less which isn't really a big problem, although some of the later issues do have um, Cheryl Blossom appearances in them. Coming down here, we have some of the Spire Archie comics. Spire was a religious publisher. Archie artist Al Hartley um, had been slipping a lot of sort of religious content into the mainstream um, Archie books, which the publisher wasn't 100% on board with. So what they did is they worked out a deal where they licensed him the rights to do these religious themed Archie comics. Um, and I'm trying to put together an entire set of these. And Spire also did some non-Archie books. So I'm putting the other set of those as well. Here's The Hiding Place, God's Smuggler. The one that I really want that I don't have is the Johnny Cash story. And then down at the bottom, we have some random stuff. A team, a run of NFL Super Pro, and some of those um, giant size quarterly books from the 90s. And then finally, on this side, we have the indie books. Um, the top rack is most of a run of Flame and Carrot. The issues before number 11 are too big to fit in. Uh, some of the early issues are sort of more like a magazine width. I don't have all of them yet, I have most of them, but not all of them. Um, Pacific Comics put out some amazing covers on Alien Worlds in particular, but they just had a tremendous group of artists. Um, here's the first, like, six issues of Star Slayer. I have probably, like, 15 copies of issue two I got at a comic store last year for 10 cents each. 
Um, that's the first appearance of Rocketeer. So if that ever takes off, then I will be um, a very happy person. Uh, we have the first uh, like eight issues of Concrete, the Grimjack Killer Instinct Limited series. I love Grimjack. I've got a complete run. I really wish that series would come back full time. Atomic Robo, those are all signed. I got those at a show for very cheap. Um, a run of Omaha the Cat Dancer I'm currently working on. And then some random stuff down here at the bottom. Ditko's World. Some stuff from Atlas. And again, I paid very little for these. And then down at the bottom is real indie books. Just like stuff people published out of their basement. With the Atlas books... Um, those are all things that I paid 50 cents or a quarter or a dollar at most for. Uh, with some of the recent news, those have increased in value and, you know, I should probably take them out of there. But, you know, I'm not going to. I like seeing them on my spinner rack. And that's it. I get to look at this every day. And if I want to grab a comic off the stack, I can just pull one off the spinner rack and read it anytime I like. So thanks very much. Um, for watching the video. If you have any suggestions for stuff you'd like to see me uh, show off for my collection or comics you want me to discuss or anything like that, you know, leave a comment and I'll see what I can do. Thank you.